don't get the echo back. Thank you. And next, I will be going to Carolyn Ramwell. Um, to introduce Carolyn Ramwell, Carolyn Ramwell has training in pediatric nursing, electrophysiology. She holds a Master of Science in Nursing. May I request the, uh, the slideshow? Absolutely, thank you. Okay. So Ms. Carolyn Ramwell is a global nurse educator, volunteer with Physicians for Peace. And she was honored at the White House as a volunteer in 2008 for her work in Sri Lanka with Project, Pe Project PEDS. As a founding member of the Global Nursing Education Committee uh, at PFP, Carolyn has promoted nursing education and professionalism throughout Central America and Caribbean and now in Malawi. In Malawi, she is the clinical nurse specialist for a pediatric surgical hospital and pediatric intensive care, which is the first in the country. She will be telling us more about that. Uh, I want to go to Rita, Rita Momo. Yes, uh, Rita Momo is a registered nurse. She's also a registered midwife. Um, and she has spent the last 15 years of her career as a nurse and 10 years as a midwife. And it's with this double trained experience that she's uh, coming into this webinar to an enable us to borrow her perspective. She has, she's passionate about excellent nursing and midwifery practice that meets international best standards. And she's a strong voice for the improvement of maternal health services in Nigeria. Rita was trained by the UNFPA on community engagement uh, on reduction of maternal and child death in Nigeria with Wellbeing Africa. She provides leadership for Mama Care Project in Abuja. Thank you, Rita, for accepting to join us in this webinar. And, and then I'll go to Sospita Ndava. Sospita Ndava is also tra is trained in um, project management and also holds a master in public health. He works with IntraHealth International and he said, and you said funded human, human resources for health Kenya mechanism. So Spira is a capacity building specialist and a certified project management profession as I already pointed to. He has 12 years of experience in Kenya, Tanzania and Uganda implementing evidence-based training for healthcare workers. In, this, in his role with IntraHealth and the Human Resources for Health Kenya Mechanism, he manages the FIA Elimu Fund and training for frontline healthcare workers, especially nurses and midwives. He's a Paul Harris Fellow and former president of the Rotary Club of Westlands, Nairobi, Kenya, Karibu Ndaba. Next, I'll go to... Um, I don't know whether I've left out anyone, but I think those might be our panelists for today. Okay, so welcome everyone. Um, as we start off this, uh, this webinar, I would like to first and foremost again, thank you so much for joining us and I want to reiterate why we're here. We're going to explore how nursing and midwif midwives education has evolved, uh, what has been our panelists' contribution to the space, and what changes need to happen to ensure that nurses and midwives continue to lead. So without further ado, uh, I would want to start engaging our panelists by starting off with Rona Briggs. So Rona Breeze, you, you have an interesting career that uh, you have been a registered nurse, you have uh, uh, been a development facilitator at Smile Train, which has enabled you contribute to the, develop the development of the nursing training curriculum. I, I would want to know from you, how has your education and experience been an enabler in curriculum design and training at Smile Train? 
So my, my background in nursing was as a critical care nurse where I worked in the UK and I trained in the UK. Um, but for the last 17 years, I've lived and worked in East Africa in healthcare facilities and in um, nurse training establishments. And so both of these, both of these um, elements of my background have, have informed the practice that I've developed. Um, one is a, a, a clinical background and then the other is a real understanding and appreciation of what the issues are that people, that nurses who are working on the ground face. And I think that it's very important to have those insights when you're developing a training, um, because we want nurses to feel that the training they receive is something that they can implement locally. It's not something that's from afar or from another world. And so I think the fusion of, of my experience is something that I've brought to this training. Would you like me to tell you a bit more about the training? <laughs> Oh, absolutely. Please go ahead with that. <laughs> okay. So I've been involved with a nurse's course, which is called Nursing Care Saves Lives. And this course was developed by Smile Train. And Smile Train provide free surgery for children with cleft lip and palates. And they do this by supporting the training and development of local healthcare providers. And Dr. Sarah Hodges, who's a pediatric anesthesiologist, and myself, we co-developed the curriculum for this course and we then um, worked as trainers delivering it and then have since then trained trainers so that other people can be leading the training. And Nursing Care Saves Lives is a, a three-day training for qualified nurses. It's a specialist cleft nursing course which was delivered to, which is intentionally delivered to in resource limited settings. And it was developed because um, cleft lip and palate surgery is, is generally um, without complications. If complications are arise, which is rarely, um, it was noted that they often occur when nurses are looking after the children post-operatively. So not in theater or recovery, but when the children are back on the wards. And in low and middle income countries, there is often a lack of skills amongst nurses to be able to recognize and respond when these incidents happen. And so the aim of this course was to equip nurses with the skills and the confidence and the competence and the knowledge that they need to be able to deliver high quality nursing care. And that's high quality holistic care on a day-to-day -day basis, but also for them to be able to know what to do when emergency arises and what action that they can take. And although these skills and the learning is specific to cleft care, um, it's anticipated that the, the learning for the nurses will, will, will have transferability beyond cleft nursing. So we're looking at in enhancing nurses' ability to assess, and to take action and these will be the learning that they won't which won't be limited to them caring for children with clefts but will be broadly applicable for all the patients in their care and one of the um, elements of the course that we really emphasize is just basic assessment and it's something that's sometimes overlooked by nurses they're all taught it but they get busy and they they start to um, limit how much assessment they do. And it's something that we really champion within the training. It is basic, but it really, really makes a difference. And so the course has this central tenet of nursing assessment. And we also teach um, pre and post operative nursing care complications. We teach nurses what to do if different complications arise. We teach them about feeding and pain management and psychological care. Um, and we also teach them um, basic life support because basic life support is often not in a general nurse's curriculum. This is a, a new skill to many of the nurses that we teach. And the training is a mixture of PowerPoint presentations and interactive activities, um, quizzes, scenarios. We, we're teaching the nurses, we're giving the nurses some content, but we're also getting them to use what they're learning practically in the classroom so that they have the skills to be able to take them back 
to their places of work. And one of the intentions of the course is that nurses are empowered to recognise how they can take a, make a difference to the quality of nursing care that is delivered in their hospitals. And also that they go back ready to teach and to share what they've learned. So we might be able to invite two nurse participants from one partner, but the expectation is that they go back and they train their fellows and they train their colleagues. And part of the training materials, we provide them with ready to teach materials. And we recognize that they might not have facilities to project and teach in large classrooms, but we give them handheld resources that they can utilize, even if they're just sitting with one colleague. Um, and teach uh, as easily as possible. And so far this Nursing Care Saves Lives has been taught to 1500 nurses in more than 25 countries. And it started in Africa, but it's now taught in the Americas, in the Middle East and North Africa, and also in, in Asia. And the title of the course, Nursing Care Saves Lives, was very intentional. We wanted to place value on what nurses do. And we wanted just to show how vital they are for the survival of the children in their care. Uh, Rona Breeze, uh, I'm going to engage you further on that. Could we hold that there and then uh, we shall come back to that? For sure. Oh, thank you. Uh, so uh, thank you so much. You have highlighted to us the need for tailored programs that are responsive to the challenges which are within the reach of the, uh, the healthcare workers or within the communities that they are working in. And that's a major highlight for me to take away. Um, I want to go then to Carolyn Ram Ramwell. Carolyn Ram Ramwell, you, ha you are involved in groundbreaking work that's quite challenging. Uh, I think from my perspective, it, it was so, it, provide an opportunity to be energizing and exciting. So tell me more about how does it feel to be part of training of healthcare workers for the first pediatric surgery and intensive care units in Malawi at Physician for Peace? And do you think in any way your education and experience has prepared you for this work? Um, yes, thank you. I do think my education, I got my undergraduate at Georgetown, which is a Catholic university. So a big part of their mission is serving the under-resourced. So that was a focus of our education. And then I got my master's at University of Hawaii, which also is an extremely diverse place to have your education completed. So I think having these two complete opposite education experiences and being in different cultures um, taught me that I need to listen to what the nurse wants to learn. And I think when I was younger, that was a, a harder lesson. I think the uh, one that our colleague just that just spoke earlier, the, the, that Rona spoke about is you really need to meet the needs that are identified by the people in the country that you're in. And I think for me in Malawi, we didn't know what we needed because we'd never been an intensive care unit before. So the nurses were, a lot of them were brand new nurses. So we spent a lot of time just learning what a stethoscope is and, and doing the early warning system that Rona spoke about, how to recognize an emergency, how to do an assessment, how to articulate that to the, to the doctor. And this was all really new for Malawi because there was never a need they didn't have such sick children to have the need for this communication style. But in reality, it was a communication style that would help all, all of the nurses. And you know, we had, a, we had a great, exciting cadre of nurses, but it took a lot of energy. And I'll have to tell you when we first started, but we started from scratch. We did a lot of simulation. We do have an iPad so we can create simulation projects. But for me, um, I did a lot of work in Central America with Physicians for Peace, doing trainings um, with pediatric burn and pediatric intensive care. And that was coming in and training what people, what the nurses wanted me to do and then leaving and then staying in touch. Very different in Malawi starting from ground zero. But there's a lot of other partners that help us. A lot of uh, the Oslo project, there's a project in Holland. So we have a lot of a nurse in Bristol. We have a lot of colleagues that can support us, but my biggest role, to be honest, is to be the voice of the Malawi nurses so that when we 
when people are making decisions, um, that it's the Malawi nurses that are the primary decision makers in that process. Because it's very easy to bring your um, evidence-based practice and best practice, but if you don't have the resources or the knowledge, you can't implement them until the learner is ready and has the skill set to do so. So it's been, you know, that's why I say at my heart, I'm, I'm actually a Malawi nurse. Rose, I can't oh, hear you. Sorry, sorry about that. But you're talking about that diversity in education has played an important role for you in realization of the importance of uh, harnessing the voices of healthcare workers in designing ta tailored uh, in-service training programs. Uh, that's quite interesting. And partnerships is also important because we are unable to do this all on our own. That was an amazing insight from you. So I want to go to our next um, panelist, Rita Momo. I would want to, Rita Momo, you're a registered nurse and registered midwife. You bring this double trained perspective to, you, to the career. How do you think uh, your knowledge and skills obtained from all your various roles have help to inform your nursing education and practice? Uh, good day, everyone. Uh, basically, as a nurse midwife, um, here in Nigeria, it's like a basic norm that every nurse is a midwife and every midwife is a nurse. We, we do the basic, the basic training, which is the to be a registered nurse or you, you are trained to be a other courses to take. So I started with the midwifery because I I have a I have a goal to reduce maternal mortality. I just feel like that's that's why I'm in this world. Like I'm to I'm here to reduce the death of both mothers and babies. So when I was doing my nursing for a while I decided to move to the to the midwifery. So I went in to be trained as a midwife. And after my midwife, my midwifery training, I, 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 I was exposed to a lot of things. And I started handling the mothers and the newborns. And again, when, after this training and I started working, I found out that it's not just myself. The, the, the other health workers, also have to be on point because the, the, the world is changing and so knowledge is changing. I just believe that after some months, nurses and midwives need to be trained to be on point so that they know what they are giving out. Because some, like in the far rural areas down here in Nigeria, you find out that a nurse or a midwife has, since her, her graduation or even a chew, that's the community health worker you find out that she since her graduation maybe she graduated like five years ago or some up to ten years ago they've not undergone any training so in well-being foundation africa we go out to far to these hard to reach communities and retrain the healthcare workers because when these healthcare workers are trained they are able to now deliver optimal care to these patients because if they if they if they are able to deliver this optimal care, the mortality rates will drop in this part of Africa. So that has been my goal, and I thank God that we are we are, we are moving. We're not yet there, but at least we're we are trying to reduce these mortalities. And then after my training as a midwife, I've been I've been opportune to train to go for some spontaneums in uh, for Madela uh, I've been I've been trained by the UNFPA by Nutrition International by some other organizations just to deliver this basic care and to be able to train I go for train uh, training of trainers training so that I'm a licensed trainer so that I can train healthcare workers make them on point so that this mortality rates are being are being um are being uh, is, is dropped and then 
we achieved the goal of zero mortality down here in Africa. Uh, th thank you, Rita. You, uh, you highlight, I think, uh, a, a, a common um, phrase that is used that if your cup is not full, it cannot outflow to, outflow to the rest. So there is need to be able to fill that cup by the in-service training to make sure that our nurses and midwives are very competent even after they have left their training institutions and are serving us uh, to be able to uh, highly uh, reduce uh, maternal mortality and to be able to actually move the needle on the rest of the indicators of health. So uh, thank you so much for that. I want to go to uh, Sospit and Daba. Um, so Sospit and Daba, uh, you are a public health specialist and uh, doing a lot of work as regards to project management at uh, IntraHealth and, uh, and the USID funded Human Resources for Health Kenya Mechanism. Is it possible you tell us more about what is this Elimo Fund? How is it, how is it or in, in any way contributing to the increase in the number of nurses and midwives available? Oh, thank you. Uh, first and foremost, I wish uh, to thank you and other organizers of this event uh, for inviting me to be part of the panel as we mark the International Year of the Nurse and the Midwife, and also for an opportunity to share insights on the work we are doing in IntraHealth International uh, through the Human Resources for Health Kenya Mechanism. So for my background, I'm basically a capacity building specialist uh, with a background in uh, medical microbiology. I did that for my undergraduate, and I have a master's in public health. And I'm also a certified uh, project management professional. So in my first job, I was employed as a junior faculty at the university, uh, specializing in training of public health uh, trainees. But over the last 10 years, I've transitioned uh, to projects where I'm dealing now uh, managing for capacity building programs for health workers, where I'm currently serving as a capacity building specialist in intra-health. So in a nutshell, just to give you an oversight of our local situation here in Kenya, is that we have a huge shortage of health workers, especially the nurses who form the bulk of, of the, what we call the frontline health workers. And this seriously undermines our ability to achieve the universal health coverage uh, strategies that we have put in place. The reason for this huge shortage is uh, mainly due to high poverty levels, especially in the marginalized areas, where accessing college education is often a luxury, and hence uh, these trainees do not have enough Enough resources to access uh, these trainings. And it's due to this uh, that in the year 2013, IntraHealth, in collaboration with the government of Kenya, uh, through a government entity known as the Higher uh, Education Loans Board, established uh, the Afia Limu Fund, which is a Kiswahili word for Afia means health and the Limu means education. So essentially, this is Health Education Fund. So essentially, this is a public private uh, partnership that provides loans specifically to students who are in the middle level training colleges who had been left out of government funding schemes for the last uh, 10 years. And essentially they get a loan of 400 US dollars uh, to pay for their school fees, which uh, essentially this is half of the amount needed for the school fees. And they are, now this loan, they are required to pay it for over the next 10 years at a re reduced interest rate of around 4%. A uh, majority of these students, of course, include the nurses, midwives, and also clinical officers and lab technicians. So uh, the, the fund has been a great success in the last seven years. We have been able to mobilize around 25 million US dollars, which has benefited 35,000 uh, health workers. Out of this, that is 5,000 health workers, around half of that, 17,500, are nurses and midwives. So a majority of these nurse, nurses and midwives come from uh, marginalized areas, so, so this, this loan is basically a lifeline for them. So currently around half of that, around 8,000 nurses have graduated and, um, and, and they are working and they're employed and paying back uh, the loan. So in conclusion, uh, this loan for us, I think it's a game changer uh, because it's currently the best performing loan portfolio uh, within the higher education loan board. Uh, this is chiefly because 90% of these students who have accessed these loans are hired as nurses, are hired as lab technicians, 
and hence they're able to pay back the loan and use the process of uh, the revolvability or sustainability of the loan. And hence, uh, more beneficiaries are able to access uh, the loan. So we are looking forward to continuing this. Part of our sustainability effort is to ensure that the counties, because health, health in Kenya is highly devolved, we want also the counties to own this, uh, this fund, including the training institutions. So we are looking at ways of sustaining the funds through uh, mobilizing more resources from the counties, from uh, philanthropists, from institutions, and also organizations that uh, will have valued our work. So thank you. Thank you, uh, Sospi Tandawa. Um, you highlight the need, actually the challenges for pe most, uh, not only healthcare workers, but actually everyone who's, who wants a good education in accessing it, most especially people located in the global south and other low middle income countries. But you have also pointed to the need to mobilize resources to fuel this kind of innovation or this kind of uh, ideas. And you're tapping into uh, for, uh, foreign and, um, and you're also trying to harness domestic resources. Um, I, I want to engage you more on that in our next series of questions. Um, I can see from the chat that our, most of our participants are already uh, uh, you know, bumping up and want to ask questions, but there's going to be a time for Q&A to be able to engage all the panelists. Uh, at this moment, I want to go into a second round of questions that are going to explore, most especially uh, digging further into this uh, kind of work that you're doing, and as regards to its contribution to in-service training, uh, whether it's pre-training, in-service training, or education as a whole, nursing education as a whole. And so to start us off, I want to start with uh, this second round with Carolyn Ramwell. The, there is, a, I think, something that we share, Carolyn Ramwell, I, I just at my organization, we harness the power of, of, of voices of healthcare workers to be able to inform our advocacy campaigns. But what have you found out as regards to best practices and importance of developing specialized training programs, apart from the voices of uh, these healthcare workers? And what have been the challenges that you are encountering so far? Um, that's a great question. So one of the biggest challenges that we had was not knowing what we needed to know. Um, and how do you empower someone with a skill that they don't have? For example, suctioning an endotracheal tube, listening to lungs, turning patients with lots of tubes, central line care, perioperative care, postoperative care, recovery care. These were all new concepts for the nurses in Malawi in this particular area um, and other places. I'm sure their skill set is you know, excellent, but this is a new philosophy with pediatric patients that are critically ill. So I initially, um, we worked on basic skills and the most important one was SBAR, how to identify a situation, give a background, do an assessment, and then make your recommendations. And we also use pediatric early warning system just for training and language. We did a lot of assessments in the general ward and every day we found kids that needed an IV, that needed a treatment, and the nurses right there and then made interventions. So I think moving into the ward with a new skill set, we already saw a change. And the other barrier is not to know what you need to know. So we decided to start champion groups and initially those groups were breastfeeding and, and basic bathing and care. And although that's not what we need, arterial line monitoring, uh, extubation, intubation, emergency preparedness, I had to let the nurses have a place that they felt safe and that they could learn those leadership skills that we would eventually develop. So we did start a parent group, a breastfeeding group, which the nurses are total experts at in Malawi, and a um, bed bath uh, hygiene group. And they seem like they weren't, they're not important, but they were important in the sense of developing a group, starting to write a standard on how you wanna do those things having an agreement, coming to consensus, and then putting forward the policy or the procedure or whatever goes with that 
with that topic. So we actually started with kind of soft topics and then continued to do the training very similar to, we did a lot of simulation, a lot of skills. And once we got our, um, the barriers were, you know, the, the nurses were not encouraged to speak up in the past. So all of a sudden we're changing culture. So we did bring the physicians into some of the training to lower the authoritative distance between the doctor and the nurses. We also did a lot of eating. Um, we had we we definitely had times where we would have snacks and sweets and lunch together, and we tried to make those with the doctors and the nurses together, so they could see what we were learning, and we could kind of lower that um, anxiety about approaching a physician with a question. Because before we started, that was the nurses identified that as the biggest barrier. They want to speak up, but they are, don't feel safe to speak up. And I think that happens all over the world. I don't think that is unique to any country. And what I find is any barrier I find in the US or in Central America, it's the same barrier, but it just might be a higher barrier or a lower barrier. I mean, it's all becomes the same issues. It just depends how they're amplified. So I think we really spoke to that and we really practice how to speak up with clinical issues and practicing SBAR. So it was really as baby steps to make people feel empowered and giving people an opportunity to use their expertise, even though it wasn't particularly, um, to me as a trainer, the most important thing. It was important in learning how to speak up and create your own voice and create your own team and put forth your own documents that you own in your language. Uh, I would want to follow up on that. You highlight the need to create safe spaces for um, nurses to be able to speak up, but you're also relating it, the need to bring in uh, other disciplines to listen to the nurses' issues. So in these small groups that you, you created, uh, who was leading these small groups and how were you able to attain a, a team, co a collaborative effort rather than solo efforts? So initially the nurses led the, the nurses all lead the groups. So the nurses started leading the groups and it was all just the nurses and um, they would have an expat nurse help them from Norway or Holland to be, and then the SEED also international. Over this last year, we had a, a SEED educator that really helped as well but it was mainly nursing groups. And as we became more advanced, we then brought in other disciplines. So we now from breastfeeding and parent care and bed and bath care, we now have mechanical ventilation, which has an ACO, a clinical officer in it, but they're not the leader. We have infection prevention, um, patient care group, which looks at everything, all the nurse sensitive indicators, and then we also have a patient education group, a nurse education group. And then that is always with some of the physicians as part of the leaders, but the leadership itself is all nurse based. So we didn't fold the providers into it until we were into more um, of the hard science groups and the training, the doctors were great. They got into that right away, but you know, it makes us all laugh together and it makes us all eat together. It makes us all have our Coke together. And I think that creates such a different relationship that it's easier to wake someone up at three in the morning than if you know them, than if you don't know them and you're afraid they're gonna yell at you for waking them up. And I mean, I feel that way too in my current practice. So I think it was just a lot of those groups are really highly functional now without any of us. They're going on right now with COVID, none of us are there. And um, we've now created a new three years in we now have the leaders of that group work with the leader of the intensive care in another like higher level group. But we couldn't have put that structure in place when we first started. It has to come from the heart. It has to come from the nurses. Uh, thank you so much uh, for highlighting the need for visionary leadership. I, I think you would be more confident in this kind of COVID-19 pandemic that the necessary skills as regards mechanical ventilation and infection prevention was shared at that time, we are finding them very useful with your shared partner, Seed Global. I want to then go to uh, Rita Momo. Rita Momo, uh, I would presume that in Nigeria, your work involves setting standards of nursing and midwifery education and practice to ensure a safe and effective care. And if that's the case, uh, how uh, have you utilized the experience uh, or in your experience, what are the current 
barriers and uh, hindrances for nurses and midwives from getting the education uh, they deserve and from being certified? And how are you addressing this or uh, do you have any recommendations for us today? Okay, um, for the nurses and the midwives, the basic issues that they have in the communities, um, now I'm not talking about the state level, I'm talking about the down, down communities, is um, funds, funds for training. Because sometimes for, just for a nurse to renew her license, she can't afford it. Because, okay, maybe she's uh, giving, doing some little work in a far to reach community and the pay is very, very little. She, the pay can hardly take her through the months. So she can hardly have what is left to renew her license. Is that bad? So um, with the little trainings we do, it's helped to put them um, up to date and then then they are able to save up and then pay for the uh, license renewal. Then um, recommendations is that if if we could if the um, we could the nurses could get some reduced reduced fee to pay for these license renewals because you know the license renewal comes with um, models which a nurse is supposed to take and then she has to pay some thousands of nairas to be able to take those models so if she's unable to raise that money at that point point meaning she's going to miss it and then wait for the next batch wait for another batch but if those um those um fees are being reduced or the organization or the state or the federal level accepts to pay this pay for these models pay for this retraining for for these nurses and midwives a lot of nurses will be trained um and thank you i want to follow up on that um who's supposed to make this uh, this kind of changes for example uh, reducing the license fees to be able to acquire the knowledge and the skills and to be certified so to renew their license who or yeah, whom I, do you recommend okay first the council the nursing council but we've brought all it up before the council and the council will tell you that they have to pay um pay the trainers, they have to transport the trainers to these places, they have to accommodate them, they have to feed them. I think if the, the, the it's in, our, it's in the um, constitution, whereby the government values the healthcare workers, because if the government values the nurses and the midwives, they'll be able to cover those um, fees for us. And when they cover the fees, every nurse will be on point. Uh, thank you so much. You talk about the need to uh, create value for the healthcare workers and also the, uh, the policy makers and legislatures being able to see this value of the healthcare workers. Thank you so much. Um, I want to go then next to uh, Rona Breeze. You gave us an amazing introduction about the work you're doing and you never does be able to understand it at least in much more detail. So I would want to know from you, what opportunities and barriers exist for the nurses you work with at this point? Well, in terms of opportunities, um, we've really been able to see the benefit that investing in nursing education has brought to the nurses. So Smile Train facilitate this training, enabling nurses to come uh, without any personal cost. And we know that nurses are often marginalized they have quite low self-esteem. They have limited opportunity to access professional development. And this is an opportunity which is created for them specifically. And we have the privilege of spending three days with them. We can bring them together, we can affirm them, we can equip them professionally. And we really see the difference that that makes, the, the change in their mindset, the change in their self-belief. Sometimes we see them having aha moments and they just suddenly they appreciate a new significance of an element of the care that they can give and they suddenly have a greater sense of the contribution that they make and and the value that they contribute to a nursing team 
And so that's a great opportunity to see that growth. Um, and we also see it in terms of their learning that we can evaluate in terms of their testing and what we, what we witness in their ability to problem solve. So these are all visuals that we can see as opportunities that the training brings during the actual training itself. But in terms of barriers, we, we know that the barrier to good care of a lack of knowledge and skills is something that we're trying to address by the training. Um, but even if we can reduce that barrier, we know that many, many other barriers still exist. And some of these are, are professional barriers, like Carolyn has talked about, the, the hierarchies and the fact that if we train nurses to take action, to initiate nursing interventions, but they get back to their hospitals where there's no expectation that nurses will do anything other than follow doctor's instructions, we know that that's going to be a barrier to their implementation. We also know that the, the, the workload that the nurses often face is a, can be a barrier. So we might teach them that um, nursing assessment is incredibly important and the value of it and how to do it and what difference it will make. But if a nurse goes back and she's got 30 patients to look after, she can never assess them, even if she's got all the skills and all the equipment that she needs. And equipment is something that um, there are, is often a barrier. Um, we can train nurses to use equipment, um, but we often find that there are shortages of the basics. And this might be in terms of respiratory monitoring. We need nurses to be able to account a respiratory rate. So they need a watch or they need a phone. We need them to be able to do pulse oximetry. We need them to be able to give oxygen if they need it and support ventilation with an ambu bag. And these basics are sometimes missing. And we find that they're, they're almost always in theatre and in recovery, but it's on the ward where the complications still sometimes arise that there are the, the shortages and the gaps. And it's something that we um, take very seriously and we audit the participants of what's available in local hospitals. And Smile Train seeks to um, fill gaps where they can to make sure that equipment can be provided. But there really is a responsibility for hospitals themselves to ensure that their nurses are equipped to be able to deliver this basic care. Because if it's impacting the delivery of cleft nursing care, it will be impacting the delivery of all nursing care. And nurses need the tools. If they don't have the tools, then the training becomes invalidated. I think of a final um, perhaps barrier for our training is that we train nurses remotely and we equip them with skills and knowledge and then we send them back to their places of work. And the, um, the transference of what they've learned into the workplace um, will be dependent on their own personal motivation, but it will also be dependent on the climate that they received into in the culture. And a way to overcome this might be to have mentors on the ground, um, ambassadors for quality nursing care who are ready to receive them back from a training and ready to support them and help them as they strive to implement things and improve care. But I think it's fair to acknowledge that a training is just one step on a journey towards improving care and it's one way to diminish barriers but we all need to take responsibility for continuing to work at the barriers that still persist so that the, the outcomes of the, of the training can be maximised. Thank you so much. You have meticulously elaborated what needs to change. Um, I, w I would want to follow up on an issue that you have raised, the hierarchy, the hierarchy issue, uh, which is existing between the doctors and nurses. And this is a shared problem, even within the context that we work in here in Uganda. But Reflecting on a call I had just seven days ago with one of the nurses who uh, was giving me a one hour call to tell me of uh, the barriers that she's facing as regards to her implementation of the work she's doing. It, it makes me think that are there barriers that are also existing within the nursing profession, for example, as regards to engagement, um, 
engagement of the young and the ordinances or as regards to those ones who are having the titles and the treatment of those below them. Do you think those are kind of barriers that are also uh, inhibiting the image, the image or preventing young nurses or preventing other nurses at lower hierarchies to emerge out and lead better in today's age? I think those hierarchies are, are, are also barriers and it's something that we we talk to the nurses about on on our courses when you go back how are you going to share what you've learned and how do you anticipate it will be received um, because we know these these hierarchies within the nursing profession can be equally entrenched and a, a young nurse might come back with lots of fresh ideas and her senior nurse says i've seen it before i don't want to do it and I think um, one way that we could work to break that down is to make sure that we, although we, for this training, we are calling the nurses who are directly involved in the patient care to the training. I think if we also facilitate discussion and communication amongst the whole nursing team, then these are things that we can begin to address. And I think you know, we, we need to put the patient back at the centre of what we're doing. And that's the reason we all became nurses. And sometimes the, the patient can get lost in the hierarchy and we need to put them back in the middle. Because I think ultimately we are all concerned at the care that we can give and the difference that we can make to a patient's life. And we, we need to let go of some of the things that hinder and hold us back from, from that being our, our main priority. But I, I do definitely acknowledge that within the nursing profession, those barriers is, exist. Okay, thank you so much for that. Uh, 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 and lastly, what's your recommendation as regards to uh, the workload barriers? The workload barriers, um, I think that um, there needs to be an appreciation of what type of care we actually want our patients to receive. And this needs to be, these discussions need to be amongst hospital administration and multidisciplinary discussion. Um, because we can't hold it against nurses if they don't deliver care when we've, we've given them a workload which exceeded their ability to be able to do so. So I think we need to prioritize the discussions where we, we we, we re-emphasize how important nursing care is. And really, if you look at 30 patients, you can only do the minimum. And that's what often happens is that nurses end up doing the minimum. But if we want to look at quality and safety, then we've got to shrink those numbers so that nurses can actually start delivering effective nursing care, which, which isn't just giving out drugs. It's so much more than that. So I think we, we need to put it on the agenda it needs to be at a hospital level, it needs to be at a, a regional level and a national level that we're prioritizing the value of nursing um, because no, numbers will always inhibit quality. Uh, thank you so much, Rana Breeze. We, we need to have much more uh, intentional discussions, trainings that boost self-esteem and confidence of our healthcare workers. And you're doing a great job at smart training in this. And I think all of us need to borrow a leaf from that if you're not already doing that. Um, next, I would want to engage uh, Sospit and Daba. Uh, Sospit and Daba, you have talked about your work with this amazing uh, Elimo Fund, how you're availing financial resources to enable nurses and midwives complete their education. But I'm, I'm, I'm wondering, apart from uh, poverty being a barrier to education, what other challenges are you facing that are denying um, uh, even uh, would-be nurses and midwives from attaining their education? Are there any other challenges that you're finding out that are preventing nurses and midwives from attaining this quality education? Uh, thank you, Rose. Allow me, before I talk about the barriers, we also have a few opportunities for, for the dancers and midwives, in particular the midwives who want to advance uh, their careers. And this is regard to specialized training. Until a few years ago in Kenya, uh, there, were only, there was only one university that was offering a bachelor's of science in midwifery. Uh, so in essence, the nurses who wanted to specialize to do midwifery 
who are required to do it at master's level, which was, was a challenge, looking at the resources, the time, and also uh, the, uh, the time off to, uh, from work. But this has changed over time, and uh, currently we have uh, colleges and universities which are offering uh, midwifery as, a, as an entry-level course. So this, this is a huge opportunity for the nurses and midwives in the country. Uh, for barriers, as you have stated, Rose, they are quite a number. And apart from uh, the power dynamics that have, uh, has been covered by previous panelists, for me, I think the biggest challenge for us to advancing the nursing and midwifery practice uh, would be the entrenched misconception uh, from the general public uh, that nursing and midwifery is not uh, a rewarding practice. Uh, they deem nurses and midwives to be assistants to doctors. And I think this has been covered by other panelists. And in this regard, you find that quite a number of students who would have uh, done nursing and midwifery or uh, gone further to pursue this course prefer to pursue other courses, uh, such as uh, the courses in humanities, such as marketing, uh, courses such as uh, uh, business administration. So this has led to a big influx of graduates in Kenya who have uh, a bachelor's uh, degree in business, business administration, but there are not enough businesses to administer, and hence they are struggling to get employed. So for us, the biggest challenge we are facing is this uh, general uh, uh, misconception uh, that nurses should be subservient. In fact, they have a nickname for nurses here in Kenya. They call them sisters because, uh, of course, they dress like... Uh, they deemed to be dressed like the, the nuns. So they are deemed to be subservient. And this is really affecting uh, the number of potential students who would want to take up nursing and midwifery as a course. So we need to change the narrative. We need to, uh, to, uh, to tell success stories about what the nurses are doing. Because for the longest time in our country, every success story about medical intervention, it has been about the doctors. Yet the nurses are the majority. The nurses are doing so much in the community. So I think it's for us to change that narrative. Uh, by uh, ensuring there's more visibility for the nurses, by ensuring that nurses are also taking up leadership positions uh, in research, in uh, policy formulation, and also in uh, implementation of, of, of uh, the work that you're doing. Uh, thank you so much. And uh, as regards to that, you, you're highlighting the need to uh, be able to create value uh, for the nurses or to, for their value to be seen by the public, which I, I think Rita has also talked about. And as regards to the opportunities, do you, do you have any other opportunities that you want to share with our audience today that you are having uh, there at IntraHealth or the USAID funded project, uh, Human Resources for Health Kenya Mechanisms? Any resources? Yes, uh, yes for us, I think we also empowering nurses and midwives uh, through various trainings that we, we are rolling out to especially empower them in decision making. And in this regard, we have uh, implemented several uh, packages for health workers, including nurses and midwives. Key amongst this is the uh, human resource management course for health workers. This course was designed from the uh, understanding or from the realization that there are so many nurse managers uh, who are managing health facilities, but they don't have a background of human resource management training. And hence, uh, this course empowers them with, uh, with uh, key uh, uh, competencies to do with uh, performance management, competencies on staff appraisal, supportive supervision, issues of uh, hiring and firing, and of course, issues of conflict resolution. So this, this is, a, is a package that we designed for, for those nurse managers. And uh, currently, it's, it's uh, doing very well. We have a lot of demand for the same. Uh, to the extent we have had now to ensure that it's, uh, it's on an e-learning platform. The next is on a, a course on e-induction. This course is for health workers who are newly hired or redesignated, and essentially is to guide them on uh, new responsibilities in the work environment. But most importantly, and in context of COVID-19, we have developed a training package for health workers, specifically for nurses, especially, who are working in the critical care uh, departments of hospitals. Uh, to care for COVID-19 patients. And this is from the realization that there were very few uh, opportunities for the nurses to access this kind of training. So we have collaborated with the Ministry of Health uh, to come up with this course on critical care management of COVID-19 patients. And essentially this course aims to uh, 
uh, impact uh, the nurses with knowledge on how to ensure there is oxygen therapy and issues of oxygenation for critically ill patients. So these are some of the packages that we have come up with uh, to ensure that we are facilitating the health workers, especially the nurses uh, in the country. Uh, thank you so much. We will be following up to get uh, any links, uh, if you want to share with us any links, so that we share with, our, um, uh, with all our participants who have att attended today. I don't know whether Rona Breeze would want to share any, uh, any resources from Smile Train that you would want to talk about to enable nurses and midwives lead? Uh, with um, Smile Train, I imagine is willing to share the resources. Uh, the resources that we develop belong to Smile Train, so I'm sure that they are, are willing to share them and we'll make them available. Okay. Thank I think you so that much. some of the, well, as I said, uh, the resources are specific to cleft care, but I think that they, they have a much broader remit than that. So I think they could be utilized and um, modified for a broad range of other settings. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, and uh, may, may I ask if uh, any other panelists feels like they want to talk about any resources they're willing to share with the panel, with the participants today to talk about that before we go into the Q and A. R Rita or uh, Carolyn, do you want to talk about any resources that you might be having that you want to share? Um, I'm willing to share. We've developed many tools, uh, needs assessments, competency checklists, uh, intubation card checklist. We have all kinds of resources. We actually have them. We created an open access web uh, program that you cannot edit, but you can access. So I would be happy to share that with participants. And they can also email me and I can share um, a lot of the Latin American resources with my colleague, Leslie Toledo, who uh, works coordinating the healthcare workers and um, the nurses at, and providers that are in Latin America for us. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> Rita, do you have any questions? Uh, do you have any resources to share? Sorry about that. Do you have any resources to share? Is that in, uh, can I consider that in no and we move to the next? Rita, do you have any resources to share? Okay. Um, if you have any, please let, let us know and we shall be able to share them with the participants. Uh, for now, uh, it's time to get to your questions uh, that you have for the panelists and I'll be delving into one by one and then we allow our panelists to get to them. So thank you first and foremost for really uh, be, being with us and, and being able to engage, raise your questions for us to engage our audience, our, panel, our panelists today. So thank you for that. Uh, so the first question I think is from Johnny of the International Collaboration of Peri and Athesian Nurses. And Johnny asks, how can we best connect to other groups to provide and advance global perianaphasia nursing expertise. Is there any panelists who wants to shoot at that? Um, I've offered my, I've, um, I'm offering my email, but I do really feel like meeting Rita and meeting, you know, Sospeta and, and all of these amazing people in Rona I do feel like there's a need for, um, we were talking about a WhatsApp group of, there are a lot of us out there that haven't connected that are in our own little silos. So we were talking about after this meeting, maybe creating a WhatsApp group so that we could communicate that way. Cause I think we, all of us and all of the participants on here probably have fantastic resources and ideas. It's just, we don't know each other. Amazing. Rita, I see you shaking your head. Uh, and agreeing. Do you want also to add on to that? Oh, okay. Then we can go to the next. Um, I think this is just a general question. Given the training and skills development nurses and midwives have been provided by all the amazing programs, what other skills and training 
should be provided to improve health seeking behaviors of the targeted populations. And uh, the participant goes on to say, and Nancy is expected to work with communities to improve health outcomes. I think it's regards to community health. Who wants to go to that? We have had so many uh, talks about uh, going to the grassroots. Who wants to address that? Is there anyone who wants to address that? Yes, possibly I can uh, touch a bit on the same. I think in our context here in Kenya, we have realized that uh, there is need for uh, nurses to be reoriented on uh, communication skills, especially uh, the community level. And uh, this is uh, also affected by several factors. Uh, a good number of the nurses here in Kenya are overworked uh, because of, uh, of, of numbers. We don't have enough, enough nurses. So by the time they get to communicate with, uh, with uh, the clients, uh, they are really tired. And of course, uh, the, uh, the information does not come out the way it should be. So I think communication skills is one of the areas we're looking at to engage them on how they can uh, communicate effectively with the, with the health workers. But most importantly, also at the community level, we have what we call the community health uh, workers who are not as advanced as nurses, uh, but they are members of, of, of the community. So they are trained on how to do first aid and how to, uh, to refer these clients to, to level one and level two hospitals. So in that regard, I think you need uh, to have a system where you have uh, referrals from the community level uh, through the community health assistance and also trainings and on human resource management and also communication skills for the nurses. Uh, thank you so much, Sir Peter. Uh, next, uh, I'll touch on the question I think that we need to uh, address. Uh, Natalie, Natalie asks, uh, oh, so sorry, it's not Natalie, it's one of our, our amazing uh, participants. Of what relevance is policy advocacy to sustain the innovations that you're all talking about? And is there a strategy that each and every one of your organizations is having to uh, ensure that uh, their policies changes that are made to uh, address the challenges that you cited? Um, in terms of what the challenge is in terms of globally, in terms of not having enough nurses or in terms of just at the bedside? Jean. I think it, it, it's targeting the, the challenges as regards to which are, which could only be solved by, for example, policy in, uh, by policies in place. Well, I can just give you an example of the most amazing and incredible thing that's happened in Malawi. And that is our nurses, you know, they're in terms of medication safety and, I, and Rona and Rita, have, you know, when you have 100 patients, there's only, you can only do as much as you can do. But one of the nurses recognized, you know, how can we avoid medication errors? Like there's no tracking system. There's no medication error system. There is a adverse response for immunization, but there's nothing for errors. So they asked me, you know, that's something we would like to work on. Well, when I looked throughout the country, there is no tracking system. There is no system for medication errors. And that's a big part of what the nurses are doing. And so we found the pharmacologists that are at the university, and there are two of them. They're incredible. We invited them to one of our meetings, which is our patient care group, and the nurses shared their problems. And they came over and they did a needs assessment with our staff. We got permission through all of the, you know, all the levels up in the hospital to have them come do a safety audit. They did a safety audit and then they came through and they made recommendations. And some of these recommendations were moving our medication card away from the sunshine, very simple. And some of them are to create a tool for medication error um, reporting. And that is now what the nurses are doing. So the, once we trial it, it'll be something that goes potentially countrywide because one of our other forms, our high dependency unit um, pediatric form is now going nationwide. So even though we're not moving to the Ministry of Health, Ministry of Health does come and visit us. We're a very high profile, very exciting place to be seen and to, to come. And so we can share these innovations we've had. So we're actually, I think, making some changes from the bottom up as opposed to the top down. But I do think as we train our leadership, our nurses that become the leaders, 
they're taking these, these ideas forward and using their voice at some of the national meetings. We actually, one of our nurses is just presenting for the first time at an international pediatric intensive care meeting. So I do think that empowerment can come from the bottom up. Obviously it'd be great to have a nurse that's in the Ministry of Health office that has the same passion as the bedside nurse with the same frustrations to make a change. But that's just one example that is extremely exciting for us in Malawi. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Karen. You're talking about the need to have a bottom-up approaches, which you're talking about. Your nurses going and representing uh, the issues that you're caring about that needs policy change. But I want to also engage Rona Breeze because Rona, you talked about um, the shortages in equipment and uh, you know machines and that kind of thing. I, I would imagine if this is a widespread pro problem. Uh, you would want to advocate more to be uh, heard and for uh, the Ministry of Health or for the Departments of Health to be able to respond to such issues. So to engage you more on the uh, participants' question, uh, is there any advocacy that you're related in, any uh, kind of advocacy initiative you're related in to ensure that such issues are addressed? There isn't any advocacy that I'm directly involved in, but the different countries and regions where Smile Train works, they have regional representatives who, who do liaise with the ministries of health in those relevant respective countries. And so I think this is something that there's the potential to lobby for locally, nationally, um, rather than continentally. Um, but I think it's something that we have to keep on the agenda because I think whereas NGOs can prop up and fill gaps, these are only temporary solutions and actually the responsibility needs to come from governments and ministries to be, to be committed to caring for their patients and there can become a reliance on, on aid and gifts and actually these, these are basics that should just be in place and, standard, and, and standardized equipment that should be available for all nurses. So I think these conversations and this lobbying is something that needs to continue. And I think we appreciate the efforts of people that are trying to um, stop the gaps in the short term until legislation and um, greater provision is achieved. Oh, thank you so much. And uh, uh, personally, I would be interested in that WhatsApp idea which was mentioned earlier. But I think what um, <clears throat> Rona is talking about, uh, she underscores the need for advocacy, but she's saying that while she might not be involved in, she really supports that kind of work. Uh, I would want to engage Sospit and Daba. You have informed us about uh, the deliberate attempts that you're trying to make at this point to be able to enhance, uh, to be able to generate locally, uh, locally available funds or to be able to uh, mobilize local funds into the Limo fund to keep it going, apart from also the foreign funds you go, you're getting. Is there any role of advocacy in, uh, in increasing that uh, fund which, uh, which is available on, or increasing the resources really that are available at hand or even just uh, addressing the challenges that uh, you are facing uh, which are away from the poverty barrier in accessing education? Uh, yes, Rose. Indeed, uh, advocacy forms a key component of our work as we try to mobilize the, the resources for Afia Limo Fund. Uh, and sustaining the fund has been one of the biggest headache for us because uh, unfortunately, uh, USAID, uh, is, uh, which is our main donor, is pulling out uh, slowly because of uh, uh, other interests. Uh, so uh, this fund had, has to mature naturally. And in this regard, we are looking forward to mobilizing resources from uh, different entities. Uh, but there's also an opportunity for us. We have realized that this fund is uh, benefiting so many government sponsored students. As we speak currently in the government medical training institution at the middle level, we call them um, uh, MTIs, medical training colleges. Over half of these students currently are beneficiaries of the fund. So what we are doing is that we are engaging with this college and uh, creating a dialogue uh, having a dialogue together and, and uh, coming to a conclusion that if this fund does not work, there will be a lot of, it will be a catastrophic 
uh, for the college, not only for the college, but also for the economy. So we are in the final stages of, uh, of, of uh, signing off some uh, agreements with these colleges uh, for them to avail this funding also for the students. We also work closely with the counties. As you know, Kenya, uh, our health sector is highly devolved. Uh, we have what we call the counties that are able to hire their workers, they're able to mobilize uh, resources. So they're also going to be chipping in uh, towards this uh, AFIELEMU fund. And how we're doing this is all basically through advocacy. So we have uh, formed subgroups with the county coordinators. We have also uh, a, a very uh, robust uh, AFIELEMU fund website that uh, details the work we are doing. But also we'll be going soon to the media, to the newspapers and to the TV and radio stations to create that sensitization on the work uh, that uh, AFIELEMU fund is involved in. And we are hoping that by doing this, we'll get more philanthropists coming on board. Already we have a few banks and foundations that have shown interest. And our biggest uh, catch, if I can call it so, is uh, Johnson & Johnson that have uh, come on board uh, to mobilize, uh, to give us some funding towards uh, nursing education. And this is around a million US dollars. So all this has been enabled by uh, advocacy efforts. And uh, we are looking forward to ensuring that this funding is, is self-sustaining going forward. Uh, I, I would want to follow up on that, Ndawa. What kind of uh, what kind of advocacy are you engaged in? Is it the one of also going for meetings, or you have other ways that you are advocating for this kind of funds? Yes. Uh, so for us, it's a mix and match of meetings, of uh, visibility through uh, through website through uh, promotional materials. And as I've said, we also be going soon to, uh, uh, to have uh, some form of adverts in television and uh, radio stations because uh, many Kenyans use them for, uh, for getting information. So it's a mix and match of meetings and, uh, and also enhancing our visibility. And from the meetings, as I've said, we are looking at mobilizing funds locally through the counties, uh, through the medical training institutions, and also through other donors. And uh, we have uh, brought on board a few so far uh, so that they plug in uh, the gap that will be left from uh, USAID and also the reduc uh, reduction in the government capitation because there's so much going on right now. There's so much demand for higher education loans. So the amount that is uh, being uh, uh, given to the uh, AFI Limo Fund is becoming lower and lower every year. So we need to plug in this as much as uh, there's high demand for, for the loan. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I also want to uh, engage uh, Rita Mom on, on this because you you are talking about the need for uh, the nursing council to reduce the funds uh, for renewing the license so that we uh, ensure that the healthcare workers obtain the necessary skills that are needed to improve their uh, in-service performance and also obtain the certification. Or do you see in any role of uh, advocacy in uh, addressing these kinds of barriers that you raised before? Yes, um, the, the need for advocacy is very, very high because um, basically if the government said it's not in the, 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 the year's bill, if the international organizations can come in and take the sponsorship for this renewal of license, meaning when the license are being renewed and then the nurses can take free models, it's, it's going to help the healthcare, healthcare uh, system here in Nigeria. And again, to add to what uh, So Peter said about their country, so it is, when, um, when the policies are not being changed and, and, and made straight and interesting for the nurses and the, the midwives, most, youths of today want to go into medicine because why should I use five credits to go in for nursing and the same five credits I need to be a doctor and then be rated higher than the the uh, higher than a, a nurse so I better go in for medicine and forgetting that this healthcare system is a round table everybody has to put his own bits to make the healthcare system better so we need the doctors we need the nurses we need the Sorry, we are losing you, uh, Rita. Uh, midwives, 
we need the Jews, we need the pharmacists, we need everybody on board. So the policy, they, oh, can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you, please go ahead. Okay, so we need a very good uh, advocacy. It's going to help us. It's really going to help us to, to make the nursing and midwifery uh, system more, more, more interesting and more accepted and then more educative. Uh, well, you're pointing towards the need to increase, uh, to make sure that nursing education is more acceptable, more interesting, right? Uh, so, yes, yes. Are there any on-ground efforts that you are engaged in, or do you see this as a collaborative effort that the nurses and midwives need to engage in right now with urgency? Okay, sorry, the the network sh uh, was shaking. I didn't get your last sentence. So do you, see, do you see this as a needed solo effort that different organizations need to do it uh, as solo efforts? Or do you see a need for a much more collaborative effort to advocate for such issues? The truth is that we need everybody's efforts. We need everybody on this. We need the international partners and we still need the government because Smaller organizations come in. Okay, like Wellbeing Foundation. Wellbeing Foundation is in Kwara State doing EMOC. After EMOC, we, uh, we are doing nutrition. Um, UNFPA also comes in to do um, some, some trainings. Um, nutrition International also comes in. So we need everybody. The truth is that the more the merrier. That's just the well, truth. The more the merrier. Um, and then uh, uh, I would want to go to... Uh, Rona Breeze. Uh, Rona Breeze, our participants want to know, are there any examples of uh, success or stories of success as regards to your work that you would want to share with the participants? I think we, we've got local success stories when we know that nurses who've participated on the course have then um, gone back to their places of work and shared their skills and taught other people. Um, we've also had accounts of, of nurses that have been able to utilize the skills that they've learned on, their, on the course. So maybe they've had an occasion where they've needed to, to demonstrate their, their basic life support skills. Um, so we have got some stories on the ground. I think it's something we've, in terms of evaluating the program, at the moment the evaluation is that we can um, evaluate the satisfaction of participants and their learning during the course. And, but all professional development for nurses, the, the reason that we do it is to improve the quality of care. So it's something that we're addressing at the moment to see how we can capture what difference this course is actually making on the, gr on the ground. Because sometimes there's a danger of thinking that you fix a problem with knowledge, but the problem is actually much greater than knowledge. And we really want to understand when nurses learn on the training, um, what are the barriers that they then face when they go back to their places of work? And are those barriers that we could address during the training or in other ways? So it's something that we are addressing at the moment. It would have been, the ideal situation would have been for this thorough evaluation to have been part of the curriculum and the program design. Uh, that didn't happen, but we're learning from where we are and we want to try and capture those success stories because I'm sure they're out there and I think that at the moment we're just not harnessing them. So it's something that we would certainly like to do in the future. Um, that would be great. Um, I, I, I would also want to engage uh, Carolyn uh, Ramwell uh, on this. Uh, do you think that there is an there is any uh, at all any importance of incentives in increasing um, nurses and midwives' uh, performance or uh, the ability to be able to take up the education? Um, I definitely think incentives are important. I mean, they work for all of us. Um, there is um, they have a thing called top off and tea, uh, so the nurses at Mercy James get tea. Uh, when we do our trainings, we provide uh, meals. Um, when we do our um, champion meals, our champion meetings, 
there's always a meal provided so that there is an incentive. I mean, we use it in the United States. If a drug company wants to sell something, they bring food to the office. So I think that idea of, of creating an incentive, unfortunately, we can't create a financial incentive because that's the Ministry of Health. But I do think that there has to be a benefit. And I also think promoting nurses to be speaking at conferences and to being able to share their knowledge is a, is a definite incentive as well. We put in six papers this last time and we had one accepted, but this is, you know, we're only three years old. And then if they actually do get accepted, a lot of these conferences have funding to help, help support the nurses come to the meetings. So I do think you have to, I mean, ideally with the Ministry of Health would in, incentivize nurses. I mean, it's much harder to work in a ward with a hundred children and, and one nurse, you know, there's what incentive is that for any nurse? So I think like all of the speakers have said, there have to be changes with the Ministry of Health. There are like uh, Rita said, they have to make nursing a field that people want to come into. But um, I think that's, you know, country by country, but I do think incentivizing is really important. I wanted to speak very quickly to something Rona was saying about measuring outcomes. That is something we've challenged with. You can teach and the patient, the, they can be satisfied, the learners. Um, we've looked at now, um, but we have an infrastructure to do it at accidental extubations, uh, infections, falls, all the things that nurses actually make a difference in. And we're using them as some of our outcome measures for effectiveness and training. Because a lot of the training we did stayed at, didn't make it to the bedside. So we've actually brought our champions now do a five minute teach at the bedside, which um, Rona spoke about having the nurses that leave be also trainers. So we've actually um, institutionalized kind of a five minute chit chat at the bedside by one of the champions for, to, to bring it home to the bedside. That's a, it's a hard leap to make, but it's a really important one. Thank you so much. Uh, and lastly, uh, uh, since our time is fast spent, I, I, I would want that if you could make it in one minute or one minute and a half, it would be uh, really helpful. Uh, this question goes to Ndawa, Sospit Ndawa. Uh, you have been talking about COVID-19. Uh, do you see the current pandemic in any way uh, affecting um, the uh, access to nursing and midwifery education um, and and also in another way maybe uh, affecting the number of nurses and midwives available to respond to this current pandemic and get our countries out through it um, and if and if yes uh, how is it affecting um, in any way your programming Oh, thank you. Uh, so for us, uh, COVID-19 has been, uh, I can call it a double-edged sword. It has brought some good tidings. At the same time, it has brought uh, some challenges. So possibly I can start with the challenges. There are so many nurses and midwives currently in Kenya who have been, uh, uh, who have been let go or fired because of uh, fewer numbers of Kenyans who are attending uh, hospitals. There's a lot of stigma currently in, in Kenya to going to hospitals. People don't be seen going to hospitals because uh, they'll be seen or de deemed to be COVID-19, uh, COVID positive. Uh, yeah, I mean, Corona positive. And essentially this has led to uh, fewer visits for these private hospitals. And uh, uh, this has led to many workers being laid off. But on the flip side, uh, there has been a huge demand for public hospitals for nurses and midwives, especially as I was talking about the critical care, because quite a number of patients are progressively becoming a, a critically ill with COVID-19. So uh, the government has started even schemes for hiring nurses in short-term contracts and midwives uh, to plug this uh, gap for the huge numbers of uh, people who are going to public hospitals for these uh, uh, services. So for us, as I said, it's, uh, it's a double-edged sword. We are seeing a challenge with the private sector. They are laying off nurses, but in the public sector, there's a huge demand for, for these nurses and midwives. And for us, we are facilitating this uh, by ensuring that we, we are engaging with the, those who have been hired to undertake the courses that I had talked about, the human resource management for health workers, the e-induction course, but most importantly, even for, for, for the critical care staff uh, in hospitals to undertake courses in uh, critical care of COVID-19 patients. Uh, we are facilitating this even through airtime. We are giving them around 10, 
ten dollars each to go to, to buy a time and go to the internet and access these courses. So for us, this is a mixture of opportunities and also uh, tragedies for for some of the nurses that you're working with. Wow, uh, thank you so much uh, for that highlight. I think it highlights also the kind of iniquities that we're living in, but it also shows the current opportunities that present with the, uh, even within the, a, a pandemic like this. Um, we left with two minutes to end uh, uh, this webinar. I would want to first and foremost thank our amazing panelists, all of you. You have been uh, very generous in sharing your knowledge, your experience, your skills. And so uh, thank you so much for uh, actually being with us throughout the whole webinar. Thank you so much. And uh, I also would want to thank our, pan uh, our participants. Thank you so much for uh, being available to listen to the, our, our panelists, but also uh, being able to ask the questions that we are presenting to them. I also would want to thank the partners on this webinar, the G4 Alliance, uh, Smile Train, uh, Seed Global Health. Thank you so much. And in this last one minute, I would want to share with you uh, uh, our monitoring and evaluation form. Could you please enable the form, please? Um, Natalie, could you please enable the form? Okay. Apologies, I actually don't have it queued up, um, but we can okay. share in the wrap up email that will circulate after this. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, so in the next uh, days that follow, we will be sending out uh, this evaluation form. I, I think the link has been shared. Uh, I think I can, there will be a link that will be shared and we will be requesting for your feedback uh, so that we know what has gone well, what has not worked, what needs to change, and what topics we can cover in the next uh, series of webinars. Uh, from me, thank you so much. It's 7, it's seven thirty from my time, but it's also one hour and a half. Uh, we are already done with this webinar. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. You're welcome.